All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined by Michael Keplinger, who is in Boise, Idaho. How are you doing, Michael? Uh, great. Thanks, John. I'm actually from San Diego myself, but yeah. been out here about seven years now. Excellent. And, and uh, Michael is with Smash Brand branding and packaging design agency. But a lot of the uh, work you do is in research and the testing team on, on um, ha unpacking how customers think and, and putting your designs and, and messaging on consumer goods, especially consumer packaged goods. And just before we were coming on air, we were talking a little bit about maybe there's a perception out there that uh, you know, branding for packaged goods or hard goods, it's not as important anymore because we get everything online and we're so you know, savvy as, as buyers nowadays. But the reality is, uh, is very different, as you would say. It is, you know, and um, uh, I forget the exact stats because they keep going up every year. But, mm -hmm. you know, 30 years ago, there may be 5,000 products at the grocery store. And today, the last I checked, it was over 47,000 new products. And so the barriers to entry are lower. And the number of products and choice that consumers have is exponentially higher. And um, so the packaging has to do so much more work today than it had to in the past. And like you were touching on, really, um, there are certain products, lower price points. It's just not mm -hmm. economically feasible to sell them online. Um, and so not only that, but we just kind of, they... They, uh, they, they go bad, like food products, or um, we just need a lot of things all at once and don't really know until we're there. And so the retail is never really going away. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's our little our space in the market where we've carved out. We just um, kind of interrupt the consumer inside their head as they walk down the aisle so we can put better products on the shelf. Yeah. And so how much of things change, do you think, over the years, given the the attention spans of people are, are reducing all the time and we're bombarded by images of digital images and images all the time? How how much has branding changed uh, in terms of packaging? Has it become more important? Do you have to change it more often? What, what has anything changed? I would say probably the biggest, um, you know, there's, we're still heavily dominated by really big brands that have products mm -hmm. that we you know, that we all know that have been on the shelf, Cheerios and things like this that have been on the shelf for, gosh, how long, 50, 100 years. And um, <clears throat> it's these, these little brands that come in and they, uh, they really kind of disrupt that and they do things differently. And so when we think about what has changed um, is uh, particularly with consumer products, is you can't just put a product on the shelf. It's, you kind of have the full attention. You can get them later through marketing on you know, commercials and things like this, mm -hmm. is you really kind of have that first impression approach. And um, so what we really do too, is we, we take some of the new modern ways, the way we think about digital marketing, where you just put it out there and you test what works. And if it doesn't work, you pivot really quickly and you have all that data coming in. But you think about a physical product on the shelf where they've printed a hundred thousand boxes and it's already mm -hmm. in the distribution channel you can't just modify it and so we try and uh, learn from how those things work and uh, mimic that type of testing and put better products on the shelf so that um, so that they can be more effective at doing the job that was traditionally done through you know through other types of marketing and have uh, and have the things that are that are effective, the design that's effective, has that changed a lot? I mean, is it, is it, do you use a lot more bright colors now? Does it have to be a lot more attention grabbing? Have, have you seen any evolutions like that? Absolutely. I think um, as you look uh, historically, because as we talked about, so many of those products still are on the shelf. Many of them are mm -hmm. kind of, I guess, in relative terms, rapidly um, modifying their brands and, and kind of facelifting that for the exact reason. Um, I think that there was a lot of really sameness and, um, and which was, which still worked because there were less products on the shelf, mm -hmm. but now you have to grab that consumer's attention. And uh, some of the colors too really uh, highlight, um, there's some generational differences and, you know, brighter colors were traditionally not used um, in consumer products nearly as much. And so it's a signal to consumers that you're a modern brand, you've, you've evolved, you've changed and you're something different. And even um, as we've had massive generational shifts, um, you know, millennials are now coming to their prime spending years. They're having children. Mm -hmm. And historically, you know, that's when they spend the most money. And, and you know, it's this little buzzword and tag word of how do, you, how do you go after millennials? And certainly through design, 
Um, you, you want to feel like you're a modern brand, a different brand. Uh, there's a lot of pushback for the traditional big brands, um, some distrust that's been growing over the years. It's sure. been kind of leveraged by things we see in the news and things like that. And so these are the things that younger new challenger brands can really gravitate towards signal that you're new and you're different and you're modern. And certainly design is one aspect, uh, among many really, but, um, but, you know, following of that, too, is um, we also will look for, you know, standing out on the shelf is not just a particular color is going sure. to work. Um, it's really being looking and doing an audit. What's out there today? How can I not only stand out, but stand out by being different? And sometimes that's uh, being what we would traditionally call, um, you know, traditional because yeah. everything is so modern and, and bright and standing out. Yeah, I was I was very intrigued by by one of the uh, one of the projects that you have on on your website in Dur in Duracell, because there for me that that looked like a classic uh, challenge there of where you've got a very very established brand, you've got a very established look and feel, but then you also are trying to bring a little bit more maybe of a modern feel or whatever and stand out and, and show that there's a range of, so tell me in, in a situation like that, that's gotta be a challenging one and a delicate balancing act of building on the traditional brand, not impacting all of the brand uh, equity that's there, but at the same time showing some kind of evolution, especially when there's a lot of competitors now. Absolutely, and you know, I'm glad you brought up Duracell because to be honest, that is a really, classic example of these big brands and the challenges that they're facing. Um, you know, Amazon, uh, Costco, they've got their own brands of, of batteries and it's a double A, they're cheap, they're everywhere. And what it does over time is it signals to consumers that this product is a commodity. It doesn't matter, mm -hmm. the brand no longer matters as much. And, but yet you still have people, obviously that's the front end of the market and there's still people yeah. that are very loyal to their brand. And so um, again, no low barriers. Anyone can go say, hey, to a China company and say, I want a new brand of batteries and wham, bam, mm -hmm. you've got a new brand of batteries and you can sell, get some traction on Amazon and, and you know, next thing you know, you could be in the store potentially selling. And so Duracell uh, comes to us and said, look, we're a huge brand that has been around so much brand equity, everything that we do just gets copied. And so what they wanted um, was something that was ownable. Um, their exact words really was that sometimes I think that the only thing that matters is the cell itself. And so, you know, when you think about colors, you can copy colors, but when you put those colors together in a certain way, like a black mm -hmm. and, a, and a copper top, which is very yeah. ownable to Duracell. And so, for them, they needed to really gravitate towards that and find something on the shelf that was um, that was still clearly, clearly Duracell, but more more than anything was ownable that the other brands couldn't copy. Yeah, and it's fascinating. I, I would uh, definitely encourage people to go to smashbrand.com and look at it because it's it's fascinating. Where this, what you were talking about, like the audit, the in-store pop, and you just show this mass of batteries like hanging there. And if you, it, it could be very, it's very easy when you go to the store just to look where's, where's, which ones are double A's and grab the nearest double A's right. and just look at the price. Um, so quite the challenge. But then when you go further, you see taking the branding, you know, with those circular lines and that taking it into you have instagram your clothing you have you know modern you know smart cars with the branding on it and all of that and uh, it really does kind of it does kind of uh, communicate uh, reliability but modern too it does and you know those are important aspects for um, established brands you need mm -hmm. to show to consumers that you are evolving that you're keeping up with the times and so a packaging refresh um, is certainly, with a consumer product particularly, is um, an important way to kind of keep communicating that, uh, you know, subconsciously to consumers that you are not a forgotten about brand and that you're staying relevant. Mm -hmm. And then you have another case study that's interesting because, okay, Duracell established brand, been around forever, predates the, you know, internet and all that. Um, you have one, I don't know how you pronounce it, is it Newton or um, Brain Newton, Food? Newton, that's, yes. Newton. Um, that you launched it launched a successful Amazon brand from scratch. So tell me about that process when you actually get so there's no brand equity there, there's nothing, you just have a concept and you know a product. I mean, how do you take that and decide which direction to go in? Sure. So that is um, 
you know, and, and I think you're touching on too, because you probably found two polar opposites of the type of yeah. work that we're going to do and probably on exactly. purpose, but, <laughs> um, but you're faced, uh, your challenges are here. So you're less concerned about the risk of losing mm -hmm. um, what you have. And what is more important here is to just stand out and be different because nobody knows who you are. And that particular product, um, you know, when that launched uh, probably almost five, six years ago, um, was kind of the early trend. Almost no one knew what keto was. And so they were really focused on these, these healthy diet oils that are much more prominent now. And, um, and so as we approach that, we kind of a really deep dive into the competitive marketplace. And um, not surprisingly, what we found was because it was the companies that were already in the nutrition space that were first to come out with these types of products. And primarily, um, those, we found that those were sports nutrition companies, which, which were heavily focused on male audiences, going to the mm -hmm. gym. And, you know, and through our research, we found that this is, you know, more related to dieting. There's a huge, um, a huge potential for women and female audiences here. And, um, but the early adopters were still these uh, male audiences. And so as we went about a design strategy and seeing what that was, um, from a design perspective, what we were really pointing at was uh, a brand that could uh, stand out, be different, and really communicate uh, almost neutral but leaning female audience. Mm -hmm. And um, and we've heard from the brand too, as they've gone into Amazon, get a lot of a direct communication with their customers. It's like nine out of 10 times that they're getting communicated with the, our female audience. And so that's on the design side. And then as you dig in there too, now we had a product that there's so many similar products uh, on the mm -hmm. shelf, um, much like a, a battery yeah. here. But so what we really pushed them for was, look, you, um, you, okay, you've told us you're going to have a single ingredient in the bottle. So it's hard, really difficult to differentiate the functionality of the product. So how can we go above that? The product today, especially consumer products, sometimes the packaging is part of the product. Sometimes you open the packaging and throw it in the trash and other times the product is resealed. We've seen that a lot on resealable bags. And so for this particular product, uh, what we found with all the products that they were quickly coming to the market and the bottles were resembled what I would call a shampoo bottle and mm -hmm. a really cheap plastic bottle um, and you use it and the oil kind of runs down, you start digging into customer reviews, people, what people are talking about when they give a three or a two star review yeah. on Amazon and they're like great product, but it leaks all over the place. And so we really push the client to innovate on the bottle itself. And um, so their product, their positioning was for female audience, which was very differentiated. And there was not really a brand that was really speaking to females. Um, and, and that female audience would, would want and appreciate a higher quality product, uh, pushing towards that, and then just uh, differentiating on the market through the actual packaging itself. Mm, yeah, and so you end up with a, a, a bottle that kind of, you know, when you open it there, it looks more like a, a high-end um, olive oil or something as opposed to a shampoo bottle, right? That's right. It was a little challenging because, uh, because they were primarily going to sell on Amazon, sure. uh, it required a plastic bottle. And uh, mm -hmm. I think maybe that's why the other competitors didn't have it, but it was uh, a lot of work to find a bottle that would work, but uh, found, found a manufacturer that made a bottle that was meant to be glass-like, um, but had more of a traditional um, core spout like you would find in olive oil. So, you know, if you think of this product, which everyone is like, supplement but it's more of a food product and uh, as you you look at the food oils that are sold whether it's canola or olive oil at the grocery mm -hmm. store they all have this type of spout uh, because yeah. it just functionally makes sense and so it was um, after you could find the pieces and put it together you know in hindsight it looks so seemingly obvious but uh, those little moves and really thinking through the customer journey and the experience and where they're having their problems sometimes you can solve them in easy ways and just really uh, stands out um, to be a big differentiator yeah, and finally, just uh, so we had a, a brand new product, we had a, an established product, and then I really like this one, the 7-Eleven, the attractive millennials to a private label, so with the prepaid MasterCard. So um, what, when you went after millennials in particular, what are the things, I know you touched on it earlier, but what are the things uh, that a younger audience, a younger demographic that really is important to them that you wanted to uh, bring to the fore in this design? So, um, you know, I could, I could speak about the specifics. And when we talk about that product category, what matters to millennials is very different than what traditionally mattered to the people who have been historically buying prepaid cards. Mm -hmm. um, but your question was really focused more on a general level. So I'll try to answer it yeah. like that because maybe it applies to the audience a little bit more. But I would say um, millennials in particular 
are more are are more concerned about um, things that, of course, they want a good product. Everybody wants a good product, uh, but they want to feel connected to the brand. They want to feel like the the brand stands for something. They want to feel that the brand has uh, it will listen to them, and they can feel a connection with the brand itself. Um, and so, when you think about it and kind of lay that into um, 7-Eleven and this particular yeah. card, I think that what we focused on was, you know, 7-Eleven, especially uh, I know in Southern California, they're everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. And in the markets where they are, they were particularly um, able to focus on that audience that is, you know, the, they're working class now, they're traveling around, they're quick, they're always in a hurry. And so the needs are, you know, sometimes they're generational too, and that the millennials getting back to their needs and what makes them different. And as it applies to consumer products, is you know they're fast paced. They're they um, they don't have time to really. Um, they they want to save time. They want to make mm -hmm. things easy and simple. And um, and so those are kind of things that you can think about how you can address that in your product or whether it's a service or a product, and connect with them uh, at a deeper level. And you know show you know even signs of of being a responsive responsible corporate responsibility and really just solving their problems that are unique to uh, you know their stage of life some of its stage of life and some of it is you know unique to millennials yeah so I mean so this so I, I found that did really fascinating because actually if you do look at that case study as well it's another example of um, trying to stand out on a very crowded uh, shelf if you like with all the different uh, prepaid cards hanging there and and what I like about this is is that yeah as you say your your challenge here is with millennials i mean you wouldn't normally associate millennials with 711 particularly i mean a lot of you would associate them you know a lot more with like trendy coffee shops and stuff right, right. as opposed to <laughs> as opposed to as opposed to 711 but at the same time i mean there as you said i mean 711s are everywhere they're convenient they're they're you know tend to be very very well run uh, businesses yeah, and you know it's um, it's easy to in marketing to try and pigeonhole people into one thing. Oh, they're millennials. They don't do this. They're too yeah. trendy for that. But you just don't lose sight of how complex people are and how mm. we do so many things. Some of them are we identify with, and so we're very vocal about like, oh, I shopped at this beautiful coffee shop, and and it's a story. But we all still buy gas, and we still have yeah. these these main needs, right? But even a, a layer deeper, there's such diversity in people. And, um, you know, if you just try, and 7-Eleven is maybe not the best example of this, but it, it, uh, it kind of gets at why <clears throat> millennials, that 7-Eleven is not out of business because millennials are yeah. on the rise, is they're, yeah. they're going there and shopping also. Yeah. It solves a yeah. need that we all have. It's maybe not as glamorous, but um, as you look at specifically, you know, those prepaid debit cards, which is, it actually has radically changed that particular industry because millennials in particular are uh, using these, which have historically been for people that kind of have a hard time getting a bank account mm -hmm. because they're just trying to avoid bank fees. And, um, and so these brands that, that have done this for a long time, they really just, uh, they have to figure out, get inside the customer's heads, all of them, and, and see what's different about them and what's driving the millennial. And a card is radically different than what has driven a person to get that card because you know, they have a hard time getting a bank account or they can't get a credit account. Um, and so those are the things where we can understand that. How are you mm -hmm. using this product and apply it to what makes them different to radically kind of change the message that the product conveys and it becomes wildly successful for those, for those demographics. Yeah, and isn't this fantastic, Michael? I think that was some, there's some great information there for people to start to understand, not just for, you know, not just for packaged goods, but I think in general for when, for your go-to-market and how you present your product or service is some really key insights. So I would actually encourage you to go to smashbrand.com and read those case studies because they are, they are fascinating. Um, Michael, all of Michael's information will be in the bio below this video, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure, we, um, you know, like you touched on, Smash Brand is focused exclusively on consumer packaged goods. And like I said, really, we are, we're forced to do all that hard work up front mm -hmm. um, because you don't get a second chance once the product is on the shelf. But everything there and a lot of what we write about in our blog is really applicable to other products. It's really easy to, if you can change it later, digital product, to just kind of throw it out yeah. there and see what happens. But, you, but there is so much value in doing this hard upfront work 
um, and getting it right the first time because you really only get one chance to make a first impression. So, um, you know, we, we've written several articles, uh, you know, and if you're interested in our work, you've got consumer product, even if you're launching a brand new product on Amazon, um, I really, you know, encourage you to take a look, smashbrand.com. Uh, you can email me at michael at smashbrand.com. Perfect. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. I'll see you for another interview really soon. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, John. Yeah.